Please be seated. <clears throat> nice warm ending to that gospel for us to all enjoy today. Woo! I mean, we can quickly ignore that part, just scratch the torture line out altogether. Let's back it up a little bit. <laughs> Actually, uh, to start off with today, I wondered if you would help me by mentally making a list of three things. You type A overachievers, stop making your list already. <laughs> Wait till I tell you which three things. I need a list of three things. I want a list. You don't have to tell anybody about it. It's going to be, number one, um, the worst thing that anyone has ever done in the world. Don't dwell on it too hard. Just pick something. I know it's a long list. Just pick one of the atrocities committed by the supervillains of this world. All right, quickly, moving on to group two. The worst thing that anyone has ever done to you. Again, don't overthink it. Don't dwell on it. Don't cry, please. <laughs> just, <laughs> just populate your list, all right? Number three. Everybody's okay, right? You've got one and two come pretty quickly, right? <laughs> Number three. It's the worst thing you've ever done to someone else. Again, I'm not going to make you dwell on it because... Many of you, if you are anything like me, feel a little bit roughed up already. You know I'm not really into feel-good sermons, so this should come as no surprise to you that you feel a little bit roughed up. But you've got a list now with things that probably don't make you feel so hot. Um, here's the, the secret thing that ties all of those together. Each one of them is forgivable. Each one of them, uh, in fact, is already forgiven Though that's a different sermon for another day. Maybe we'll do that around Easter time next year. Each one of those is forgivable. Now, as I say that, here's what I know is happening to you. You are picking the one of those that is your favorite one to loathe on your list, and you are arguing with me in your head. Not that one. <laughs> yes, okay, maybe this one that was on number two for me, but not number three, the thing that I did. That's not forgivable. Or maybe the thing that I did is forgivable, and maybe the thing that my neighbor did or my spouse did or my child did or whatever else, maybe that's forgivable, but not uh, whatever you pick for number one, right? All of us will be oriented toward choosing one of those as our favorite to believe that God or we cannot possibly forgive. And We'll hold on to maybe at least one of the other ones as being, okay, well, that one's not so bad in comparison to the other ones. On a scale of 1 to 10, number 1 uh, on my list is like a 9. Number 2 on my list is like an 8. Number 3 on my list is like a 4. It's not that big of a deal, right? We all have these ways of suddenly doing these mathematics. These mathematics are not actually helpful in understanding the gospel. And that's where we find Peter today, trying to do some mathematics on figuring out the depths of forgiveness in the church Jesus, if a member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive that person? Seven? Seven seems like a great number. Seven shows up in the Bible a lot. Seven is more than just turning the other cheek, right? I've got to turn the cheek a couple times, right? Seven? Feeling good about himself, as Peter usually does right before he puts his foot in his mouth. <laughs> Jesus responds, not seven, Peter. Seventy-seven. And in fact, if you're looking closely at the Greek, you might want to read it 7 times 70, so 490. And what you actually should see is that Jesus isn't really trying to pick a number. He's just trying to make sure Peter understands there is no number. Keep going. Keep going, keep going, keep going. I imagine that Peter's face was so astonished that that's why we don't have any sort of segue between that and the story that Jesus tells. His face said enough for Jesus to know I better tell this kid a story. <laughs> and so he tells this story of a, a Lord who has many slaves, but one slave has a debt owed to him of 10,000 talents. And this is like an old school Sunday school question. How much is a talent worth, right? A talent is a, a weight, a measure of weight. Uh, equivalent, in this case, uh, almost always talking about silver, equivalent to something like 10 to 20 years wages. 10 to 20 years of wages. Average it out. Call it 15. 15 years wages. He owes 10,000. 150,000 years worth of wages. He's not getting out of this debt. When he comes to his master and says, 
hang in there for a little while. I'll get your money. Oh, please, right? <laughs> no chance. And yet, that is the debt that his master forgives. Now, when this slave goes out and fails to forgive someone else, he fails to forgive something like, I don't know, a few months' wages, right? Hardly anything. Maybe three or four months. That's the number of denarii. Somewhere in the mathematics of that slave in this story, he fails to understand the depths at which he had been forgiven or the depths at which he had been loved. And so he fails to act out of that. And according to Jesus, that is such a threat to Christian community that it can only be like some sort of contagious virus quarantined and cut off until it fizzles out. It's a dangerous thing for the Christian community to fail to understand what a great debt we have been forgiven. Because if we don't understand that, then it's too hard for us to forgive whatever it is on our list takes top priority for us. As uh, one great theologian put it, our failure to forgive, or actually he says forgiveness flounders when we fail because we either exclude ourselves from the community of sinners or we exclude our enemy, he calls them, from the community of God's beloved children. And we're quick to come up with different ways to do the math on that, right? Well, I'm not really that big of a sinner or that person has excluded himself from the community of God's love. And the theologian Miroslav Volf is his name, says that that gets eradicated when we spend even a little bit of time at the foot of the cross. If we spend just a little bit of time with the gospel, suddenly we know without a shadow of a doubt that we are included in the community of sinners and that we are also, along with everyone else, included in the community of God's beloved children. Because that is what is displayed to us on display from the beginning of the gospel all the way to when Jesus says from the cross, Father, forgive them. We see this God on display that loves humanity with such depth that nothing could possibly separate humanity from that love. We see on display a God that is so merciful that even as his son is being crucified. He hears the prayer to forgive and is willing to extend forgiveness. No one is beyond the community of the sinner, sure. No one is beyond the community of God's love. What I know is that there are still some of you calculating and wondering, well, what about the thing that's number one on my list? At the 9 o'clock service, you wouldn't believe the people who came out and shook my hand and said, uh, most of them did not name someone else. They all picked number one so that they could name some abstract figure. What about Pol Pot? What about this? What about the gas chambers? What about whatever? We always do those calculations. And I am thankful that Jesus uses an economic model here instead of one that involves violence because it makes it a little bit easier on all of us to understand. But the bottom line is the bottom line. There's either nothing that is unforgivable. Either everything is forgivable or nothing is. Either God has the capacity in God's mercy to forgive the worst of the people on my list or God doesn't have the capacity to forgive even me. And I better, I better take my collar off, hang it up and go home because if God can't do that, there is no reason for any of us to be here today. It's that serious to us and to our understanding. Because if we don't understand that, we can't be who we need to be. Briefly, I'll tell you that in my wandering away from church as a teenager, it is exactly that that pushed me away. For those of you who are, are in the lives of some young, some young person, I will tell you that young people are, are able to put up with a lot of hypocrisy in the church because they understand a lot of it, because they see it all the time. What they don't understand 
is when we come together on Sunday and we talk about this God that is loving and merciful and we don't act like it at home. We don't have the capacity to forgive those people who've done us wrong. We don't show our children that forgiveness. Rarely is there a lot of tolerance for that. I watched the United Methodist Church in Jessup, Georgia turn its back like that on somebody who's on a scale of one to 10, whose crime was pretty petty, maybe a four or a three. He had betrayed their trust. I get it. But they failed to forgive, I think, because they failed to take seriously the depth of God's forgiveness, the great debt that we have all been forgiven, and the depth, the inestimable depth of God's love. I found my way back eventually because I found people who were willing to tell me about their story of forgiveness, and eventually because I found my own story of forgiveness. I want to share with you, uh, I'll shrink it down to just two. I'll do two, because uh, I know I can stretch these things out. Y'all know I can too. <laughs> forgive me. You have to. <laughs> Today's not the day not to forgive me, right? <laughs> I'll tell you, I ran into a guy named uh, Joe one time. Joe is... Um, Joe was convicted of double homicide uh, 35, 36 years ago. Joe uh, was a kid. He was strung out on, on some sort of drug. He found his, I think, girlfriend at the time uh, being abused somehow and in a fit of rage murdered the two people that were committing the atrocity, right? So he gets locked up. Uh, 30 some odd years later, he finally gets out of prison. Guess what Joe does? Joe goes back to prison to minister to other people because so few people will go into prison and say to someone carrying the weight of a great debt, guess what, whatever it is that you've done is not beyond God's loving mercy. He did that as one who began to understand even while he was in prison, as he began to hear the story of his own forgiveness and know it to be true, he found out what real freedom was like. He found freedom in prison. So much so that even after he got out of prison, he would go back just to share that story. Just to let somebody else know that they could be freed. When I met Joe, I also met another man, a Lutheran pastor. Uh, this guy and his wife had a history of taking folks in and trying to help them. And at one point, uh, I, if I understand, if I remember the story correctly, uh, they had taken somebody in who then uh, proceeded to, I think, try to rob them. And in the process of the, uh, the robbing, he ran into this pastor's wife who didn't try to stop him, but he was scared enough that he killed her. That person, too, went to prison, was convicted. That pastor followed him in not as a prisoner, but followed him in to forgive him and to forgive everyone else who had a story like him, to make sure that they knew that it didn't matter if their debt was three months' wages or if it was 150,000 years' wages, that it wasn't beyond God's mercy. And neither is yours. And neither is anyone else's. No matter what is on your list, Pick one, pick any of them, and know that our God that we call almighty and all-powerful is mighty enough and powerful enough to forgive even that. And if you don't believe me, take yourself in your prayer to the foot of the cross and listen carefully to Jesus speak to you. Listen for those words of love. None of us standing at the foot of the cross witnessing what Jesus has done can stand there for very long without understanding that we are a part of it. That our sin is there, as is every other sin that has ever been committed or ever will be committed. And none of us standing there for very long, I think, can but help to feel the eyes of Jesus on us, not casting shame upon us, but instead asking us to pick up our chin, gaze upon the cross, and see the full display of God's love. If we do that, I am convinced 
each of us will find it to be true that when our ability to forgive has floundered, it's because we just weren't listening enough to Jesus tell us of God's love. And perhaps we should listen again and go back wherever it is on our list we choose to begin and start all over. Amen.